Good morning. Happy Saturday to everyone. Today is the last day of our equity conference week, and I welcome all of you. I'm Charles Toombs, CFA president and professor of Africana Studies at San Diego State University. My pronouns are he and they. I live and work on Kumeyaay land in the San Diego area. I'm medium brown in complexion, bald headed, wear glasses. I have a jacket and on today. Uh, before we begin today, I'd like to take this time to thank again, all of the folks who were, who were responsible for this amazing week that we have had. I appreciate so much the work of Kiara Kiki Lee, our events coordinator, Jamila Bellinger, Adrian Ray, Audrina Redman, our program director for anti-racism and social justice, Sharon Elise and Chris Cox, our AVPs for the Council of Racial and Social Justice, and our tri-chairs, Nicholas Centino, Talitha Matlin and Aparna Sinha. Before we begin, as we do with most of our CFA meetings, we will do a land acknowledgement, a community breath or grounding in, and our interruption statement. I will start with our California land acknowledgement. We want to recognize the land is an expression of gratitude and appreciation to those whose territory we reside on and a way of honoring the indigenous people who have been living and working on the land from time immemorial. It is important to understand the long standing history that has brought us to reside on the land and to seek to understand our place within that history. Land acknowledgements do not exist in a past tense or historical context. Colonialism is a current ongoing process and we need to build our mindfulness of our present participation. Acknowledging the land is an important indigenous protocol that we are honoring here today. We are so honored today to have Dr. Luke Wood presenting on race lighting. And before I read the short uh, biography, uh, I want to just say a couple of personal statements about Dr. Wood. Uh, I first heard of Dr. Wood from Dr. Cecil Canton, who said to me, uh, you have a new assistant professor on your campus. And uh, of course I was chapter president then uh, and eventually reached out to Luke to get him to join CFA. <laughs> uh, uh, he didn't join the first time around. I mean, he took a, maybe the second meeting but he immediately joined, he's a busy person. Uh, but what I want to say now is he came as an assistant professor and I blinked, and this was the next year, I think, he was associate. I blinked again, he was a full professor. I blinked again, and he was this full professor. I blinked again, he was distinguished professor of education. Blinked again, he was associate vice president. And blinked this last time, and he is vice president for student affairs and campus diversity. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen when I blink again <laughs> with this amazing uh, scholar and administrator. Uh, as I said, he is currently our Vice President of Student Affairs and Campus Diversity at San Diego State. Uh, he also serves as a co-director of the Community College Equity Assessment Lab, a national research and practice center that partners with community colleges to support their capacity in advancing outcomes for underserved students of color. 
Wood's research focuses on factors affecting the success of boys and men of color in education with a specific focus on early childhood education and community colleges. In particular, his research examines contributors, and there are many, such as social, psychological, academic, environmental, and institutional uh, that relate to positive outcomes. Dr. Wood has delivered over a thousand scholarly, professional, and conference presentations. His research has been featured by NBC, New York Times, Chronicle of Higher Education, Huffington Post, Fortune Magazine, Los Angeles Times, Miami Herald, San Francisco Chronicle, C-SPAN, and National Press Club, among others. Dr. Wood has authored over 170 publications, including 77 peer-reviewed journal articles and 16 books. He is absolutely amazing and brilliant. And those of you who know me, I don't sort of toss the, the brilliance term around too much because I believe all of us are brilliant. But he is just amazing. Um, so we are honored to hear his presentation today on race lighting and during the Q&A session, I hope we also are able to talk about some of the amazing systemic changes to SDSU culture that he has been a part of leading. So with no further ado, oh, one other thing, there is one further ado. Dr. Wood is one of the kindest. He has the biggest heart. He is such a warm spirited man. And I am honored to have him as a colleague. That's my last to do. And I'll turn it over to you, uh, Dr. Luke Wood. Thank you so much for that very, very kind introduction. Um, as was mentioned, my name is Luke Wood. And my pronouns are he, him, his. I proudly reside on Kumeyaay land, and I am a light-skinned black male with a blue shirt and a chopped up looking Afro. <laughs> and just like uh, my colleague, I am light-skinned, but I am black, black, blackity black. Um, and again, um, Dr. Toombs, thank you so much for that very kind introduction. Uh, knowing you and, and being able to engage you um, has been one of the blessings of being at SDSU. And I'd also say the same for Gloria Rhodes, who, who is here as well. And I want to thank everyone for the opportunity to be here and be able to talk about the work um, that we've been doing, uh, focus on race lighting. And just to jump to, to what that might be, think about it like this. What happens when gaslighting is racial? And that's essentially what we're going to be talking about today. And I would, would note that uh, the comments that you'll hear are reflective of the work um, and research that I've been doing in collaboration with a colleague, uh, Dr. Frank Harris III, who is also on faculty at San Diego State, and we are um, from the same academic department. And uh, I would say that, um, Dr. Toombs, that once you blink again, that I look forward to being um, back and working with, um, with our faculty. So uh, I wanted to begin just with a, a personal, very quick uh, anecdote, and just to note my own personal introduction to the California Faculty Association. When I was a, a student at Sacramento State, I um, come from a small town in far Northern California called McLeod, about 1,600 people. I grew up um, in a place where me and my brother were the only African-Americans in our school and came to Sacramento, which was a very diverse place, a very diverse location, and um, had the opportunity to really just try to learn more about myself and try to find my place and space within that community. And I remember very vividly my first semester on campus, I was walking and I saw a uh, darker skinned black male approach me 
and simply said, what's up, black man? And I, I turned and I looked behind me to see uh, uh, who is, is he talking to somebody else or is he, is he talking to me? And he was talking to me and he introduced himself and said that his name was Dr. Cecil Canton and that he's a professor of criminal justice. And if there's anything that I ever needed that I should know that I can come to him and that he'd be there to support me. Never met him before in my life, but the very minute I met, he basically said, I'm, I'm there for you, I'm here to support you. And what's interesting is I've never took a single class from him while I was a student. I've got my bachelor's in black history and political science and politics and my master's in student affairs never took a single class from him. But that being said, he was and has been one of the most influential educators I have ever met in my life. And it's a relationship where it's a familial relationship. It's not, uh, I don't see him just simply as a professor. I see him in many ways as, a, as a, another, another father. And it was that opportunity that introduced me to the California Faculty Association where I went on to work as a student intern. And I remember there's a picture here that I was able to find this morning as I was uh, thinking about this presentation for when we were uh, down at the Capitol, the state Capitol, and we were had organized a number of students to come and join the faculty members as uh, we were renegotiating the contract at that time under Chancellor Reed. And so I just wanted to say that one of the things that I've learned uh, from Dr. Canton and from this work is you don't actually have to have a student in your class for them to be your student and for them to be influential in your life. And so today's conversation is talking about the challenges that, that students often face, but also our faculty and staff as we navigate institutions that were oftentimes never designed to, to support the learning, the growth, the development, the professional trajectories of, of faculty of color and women of color and women faculty. And so we're talking about race lighting and I'd like to start on the left-hand side of your screen, which is what are the things that influence our society to get us to this point where we have these experiences with race and racism in our, in our institutions? And it really begins with things like white supremacy, where we know that there are uh, perspectives that some people held, hold that believe that individuals from white cultures and white ideologies and backgrounds are of greater worth and, and more worthy than those um, who come from other communities. And so you can see a definition here of, of white supremacy on, on the screen. And when white supremacy is then melded with uh, a nationalistic uh, perspective around a certain identity, uh, then that can also then be linked to uh, what is called white nationalism, which is the linkage of white supremacy values with those of the nation state. And then when we think about how then people can oftentimes respond to, um, to issues of racism when it's brought to them or racial conflict, it's oftentimes can trigger defense mechanisms and those who do not have uh, healthy ideologies um, around what it means to um, engage in these important conversations. It's further fueled by the pervasive anti-blackness and anti-indigeneity in our society. Anti-blackness is a, is a really a, a unique way of looking at racism in that we recognize that the racism facing black people in this nation is uh, different than the racism that faces other communities. All communities fake, face a unique form of racism. And anti-blackness is interesting because it's a global phenomenon. In many ways, people refer to it as its own pandemic. And in order for it to be something to be a pandemic, right, it can't be localized to a specific region or locale. It has to be something that is a global thing. And no matter where you go in the world, you will see anti-Blackness take root. We're seeing it with what's happening in Ukraine with African immigrants. Uh, we see colorism even in Africa. Um, and here in the United States, we've seen a unique strain of this that's been highlighted by the Black Lives Matter movement in response to the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, Ahmaud Arbery, and many others. And it really is connected to this notion of seeing Black people through the lens of, of being those who were enslaved and that being a starting point of thinking about Black people in a dehumanized way. 
anti-indigeneity is rooted in the Generate the genocide of, of native peoples and negative perspectives of individuals who are from our native and indigenous communities. And so if we think about how these things um, are, are serve as a foundation for our society, they lead to two different types of bias, explicit bias and implicit bias. Now, explicit bias is overt, it's intentional. People think about a group in a certain way and they and they consciously hold those beliefs. As you can see on your screen, it's overt and intentional beliefs that negatively view, characterize, and engage others. Oftentimes, these biases are self-reported by individuals as being consciously held. And if you go to a campus anywhere across the system, anywhere across the country, you will see explicit bias at play, where individuals consciously hold uh, negative perspectives of groups and use racial epitaphs, you'll see swastikas, you'll see white supremacist organizations putting flyers on campus. Explicit bias is a real thing. And oftentimes people jump to want to talk about implicit bias, but explicit is also part of the conversation. A lot of what we want to think about, though, is how bias can be subtle and beneath the surface. On your screen are two different definitions and one description of implicit bias. I'm going to read the one that I think is the, the most pertinent here for this conversation, and it's from the Kerwin Institute. And they say that implicit bias is the attitudes or stereotypes that affect our understanding, actions, and decisions in an implicit manner, activated involuntarily without awareness or intentional control. It can be either positive or negative, and it says that everyone is susceptible. It doesn't say that some people are susceptible or that most people are susceptible, that everyone is susceptible. That includes me, that includes you, that includes everyone who is participating in this and may see this in the future. And there's some really important elements to this definition, but what stands out to me is this notion that bias can be either positive or negative. We can see some groups and think of them as being of greater worth, as more moral, as more intelligent, and simultaneously see other groups and see them as lesser worth, as less moral and less intelligent. And ultimately those biases inform our actions and create experiences for our students and for our faculty that can treat us as if we are less than ideal. And oftentimes the ways that that bias is communicated is through what are called microaggressions. And in this context, racial microaggressions. Now racial microaggressions was a concept that was created by a Harvard scholar, black scholar named Chester Pierce. And what he was looking at was how mundane everyday racism serves to create an accumulation effect that can have a negative impact on Black people. Since his writings, the, the concept has been significantly extended by scholars such as Daniel Solorzano, Darwin Sue, Miguel Seha, and many others. One type of microaggression is what is called a micro assault. It's actually the type that's very uh, infrequently talked about because what it is is really what people call good old fashioned racism, calling someone um, a racial epitaph, for example. A lot of though the microaggression literature is focused on the more subtle forms of microaggressions, which are called micro insults, where you're insulting someone, or micro invalidation, where you're invalidating their their lives and their experiences. According to Daryl Wing Su, you could define racial, mi racial microaggressions in, as brief and commonplace, daily verbal, behavioral, or environmental indignities, whether intentional or unintentional, that communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative racial slights and insults towards people of color. Said differently, it is subtle racism that accumulates through put downs, dismissive looks, it is part of the normal experience that people have in this nation. Some people and some psychologists have said that it can actually be more uh, psychologically damaging than direct acts of racism. And I believe that to be true. I, as I mentioned, I grew up in far Northern California and as a uh, foster child who ended up being adopted in a transracial adopt uh, adoption and growing up in a white community, it was very common, in fact, not just very common, but a daily experience for me to be called the N-word, a cottonhead, a nigglet, or some other racial epitaph as a part of my daily experience growing up. And it really wasn't until I came to college in Sacramento at Sac State 
that I recognize that there's different ways in which racism can manifest. And, you know, as a child, if someone calls you the N-word, you know what to do with that, right? You know what box to put that in. That's the, that's the racism box. And so as a child, you say, okay, well, I know I'm not inviting them to the birthday party. I know what to do with that. But with microaggressions, it's more subtle. It's more beneath the surface. It's someone who says to another person with a sense of surprise, oh, wow, I didn't expect you to know that. Or the student, the black student or darker skinned Latino student who's on campus at nighttime and is asked for their ID constantly because it's assumed that they're going to be up on campus to steal something. And so what happens is you don't know how to place that. And what is called is attribution ambiguity. It's a sense of haziness that comes around that. And what we're, we believe is there's a connection between that and race lighting. Now with microaggressions, it's not what's said, it's what's really said. And if we were in person, I'm a calm response type of person, I would ask you to repeat after me. I would say, it's not what's said, it's what's really said. So in wherever you might be, I ask you to say, it's what's really said. Because what's said is, oh, wow, you're so articulate. But what's really said is, I didn't expect that you would be. What's said is, can I see your ID on campus at night? But what's really said is, I think you're here to steal something. What's really said is what's on your screen. You're different from us. You don't belong here. You're not intelligent or capable. People of color, they're lazy. They don't care. Your experiences, your perceptions are wrong. You're too sensitive. You're a criminal. You're dangerous. You're deviant. You're not of worth. Those are the messages that are really said to our students of color and to our faculty of color. And ultimately, we believe that we have to have intentional strategies to address it. Now, there's all different types of microaggressions, and some of them are on your screen. And this is not a conversation really on microaggressions, but how these messages produce race sliding. But three of the common ones that we see are an ascription of intelligence where students and faculty are assumed to be less intelligent and less capable than their peers. Assumptions of criminality, where we're assumed to be dangerous, deviant, or up to no good, to cut corners. Uh, I remember one time when I was on faculty, I had put together an agenda for a meeting and literally just a written agenda and have come to the meeting with the agenda print, printed out. And the response from one of my colleagues at the time was to say that it was manipulative that I would come to the meeting with an agenda. And it it's an example of how these assumptions of criminality can play out along racial lines. I also remember when I uh, first transitioned into administration, I had went into a meeting to speak um, and I had stood up to do a presentation. And after I was done presenting, uh, someone pulled me aside to say that people were concerned that I had stood up to present. And in my mind, I was standing to be respectful. And they and I said, well, well, how did it come off? And they said, well, you came off as aggressive. And so it's these subtle things that, again, accumulate over time. And the third one that we see as common is being treated as lesser than, as a second-class citizen, or as what Caroline Turner calls a guest in someone else's house. But this ultimately leads to what is referred to as race lighting. Race lighting, as I mentioned, is like gaslighting, but when gaslighting is racial. It comes from and is informed by microaggressions, whether they're micro insults, micro assaults, micro invalidations. Racial microaggressions are messages that, that people receive, race lighting, all race lighting messages are microaggressions. Now, we did a brief that we released a couple of years ago now, and we've done a number of different uh, pieces that have focused on race lighting. And this, it, it, on your screen, you can see an image of the cover with a, a black female on the front of that cover, and also the link if you want to go and retrieve the brief, it's at bmmcoalition.com backslash race lighting. And BMM um, stands for Black Minds Matter, uh, which is the, uh, the organization that we operate. Now, with gaslighting and race lighting, and knowing that the two are connected, I thought it would be important to say, well, where does gaslighting come from? Because people use the term all the time in our everyday conversation. 
And it actually comes from the 1938 play Gaslight written by Patrick Hamilton. And in the play, the, there is two main characters, Jack and Bella. And Jack and Bella are becoming, are, are married and they are white and they're moving into this affluent neighborhood. And in the play, Jack is the villain and he is constantly victimizing, um, and he is constantly victimizing uh, Bella. And he does things to intentionally make her feel as if she is losing her mind. So for example, he has in their home, they have pictures on their wall and paintings. He takes the pictures down, takes the paintings down and he hides them. And then he accuses Bella of stealing them. He goes to the kitchen and does the same thing with knives and forks and spoons, hides them and then says to Bella that she has stolen them. And whenever she tries to defend herself, he pushes back and talks about how she is lying to him. He does the same thing also with his own pocket watch. And she, uh, uh, pro, you know, pro, pro, you know, she says that I didn't do this. And she talks about her innocence. And he again talks about how she imagines things. In the house, there is a secret room that Bella does not know about. And in this room is Jules. And I'm not gonna tell you why that is because I want you to read the book and see the play. And he is banging around in this room that she doesn't know about looking for Jules. And she hears the noise and again, brings it to his attention and he pushes back saying, well, you know how you imagine things. You know how you make things up. But the main part of the play and where the term gaslight comes from is that in the house, the house was lit by gas. And so if you were to have gas light on in one part of the house, and then Jack going into this hidden room and he has and lights another gas light, there's less gas to go around, the lights become more diffuse and the lights dim and flicker. And she notices this. She sees this with her own eyes. She sees it with the lamp on the street as well. And she says to him, did you see this? Did you see the light dim, the light flicker? And he says again, well, you know how you imagine things. And so gaslighting is really a form of psychological manipulation where a person is intent upon making someone feel as if they are losing their own mind. The concept itself was uh, further elevated in this book by Robin Stern called The Gaslight Effect. And really, if you look at the, the earlier research literature that was on gaslighting, it is really conceptualized in, as occurring in a relationship between a, in a heterosexual relationship between a man and a woman where the man is the perpetrator and he is victimizing um, um, his partner. The term hasn't really been uh, adequately applied to other forms of marginality, though there is some really strong pieces that I've read focused on how uh, students who are queer students and parents of transgender students can make uh, their students feel, their children feel as if they're being gaslighted. And so that would also be part of, of some of the work that we're aware of in this area. For us, we think about it in the concept of the outgrowth of microaggressions, the outgrowth of microaggressions, whereby people of color begin to question their own thoughts and actions due to systematically delivered racialized messages that make us begin to second guess our own lived experiences and realities with racism. And so if you think about the accumulation of microaggressions in environments, and how that can make you feel, or even the direct exchange between someone that you brought an issue to their attention and them pushing it down. And you begin to say to yourself, maybe it's me. Maybe I'm not smart enough. Maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe I don't belong here. And it's that doubt, that disorientation, that's race lighting. And ultimately, race lighting can make people of color begin to second guess their own experiences, feelings, capabilities, knowledge, decision-making, recollections, and be, are even our basic humanity. And so what I'd like to do is to point out some of the signs that you may be experiencing even in your own life as a, as a faculty member, where it may be an indication that racialized gaslighting or race lighting is taking place. Second guessing yourself, feeling disoriented and hazy, a general sense of unease and anxiety, feeling like you're constantly under fire 
and that you can't get things right and that people are constantly nitpicking you to the point where you're beginning to feel like you're making mistakes or more prone to do so. So you begin avoiding others and may even have a sense of hopelessness that goes on with that. Now, there are different types of race lighting. One is active race lighting, where the person is intent upon making someone feel as if they are losing their mind. This is very uh, similar to what you see in the play uh, Gaslight, where someone has said something, let's say that it is a, a racial epitaph, and you bring it to their attention and say, don't do that. That's something you shouldn't do. And they actively deny that they've said it or misdirect in some way. There can also be passive race lighting, which is really just the accumulation of microaggressions in an, environment, in an environment that can make us feel this way, that we're second guessing ourselves and again, losing our minds. It can also be defensive where you bring an issue to someone's attention and they just simply dismiss it. So race lighting is important in that it also then leads to other outcomes that we have to be attentive to. Imposter syndrome, stereotype threat, but one that really stands out to me is the work of Dr. William Smith from the University of Utah on racial battle fatigue. And so racial battle fatigue is a framework that he's made and created, a coin that he's termed for making sense of the cognitive, the emotional, psychological, and physiological effects of being a person of color in a racist environment. And what he's been able to show is that when you're experiencing racism, even subtle racism, even the mundane racism, that ultimately it has an effect on you because you're in an environment where there is a persistent risk and a persistent stress. And the term is called racial battle fatigue because the outgrowth of that environment is very similar and akin to combat stress syndrome and the effects that that can have. So there can be a cognitive impact. You're in an environment that's, that's racist, your ability to retain and process information, to think clearly is impacted. But in addition to that, there could also be physiological effects, physical effects, attention headache, backache, an elevated heartbeat, an upset stomach. Many of us clench our jaws at night, have an inability to be able to sleep, have the shakes in the middle of the night. These are examples of how there can be a physical effect of racism on our bodies. And in the work that we do, particularly in early childhood education, we see this beginning at the earliest levels of school, where even a young child in kindergarten, let's say that there is a, a black boy in kindergarten and he's in an environment where he's going to school in an environment where he is not supported, he feels like he's constantly being targeted, but he doesn't know how to say to his parents in the morning, hey, I'm in an environment where I'm experiencing microaggressions or I don't feel a sense of belonging at school, right? They don't have the language yet to say that, but what they do know how to say is this, I don't wanna go to school. And the parent responds and says, well, why is that? And their response is to say, because my stomach hurts, because their body is having a physical response to an environment that is unhealthy. But it can also be psychological in nature, constant anxiety and worry, increased swearing, sleep broken, haunted, conflicted dreams, intrusive thoughts, loss of confidence, emotional and social withdrawal, anger and anger suppression. And so the reason that we talk about issues such as bias and microaggressions isn't simply because they're good topics, but because they cause harm, because there is a true impact on us through race lighting, through racial battle fatigue, through stereotype threat, through imposter syndrome. Racism cause harm. And so with that, I'd like to show you this framework. There's all different types of, of racism and ways in which microaggressions and race lighting are communicated. We break it down into four primary areas. The first is stereotype advancement, where people intentionally advance stereotypes that people of color are criminals, that we're less intelligent or less capable to do our jobs, that we're lesser than just in general, or that we're emotionally unstable. And when an individual is purposely advancing this to undermine our experiences, our reflections, our reality, our contributions, that leads to race lighting. It can also be inauthentic allyship, uh, where someone pretends like they're going to protect you or that they're there to support you and they're really not. We see this lots of times, particularly when I work with community colleges and they hire a faculty member of color into a department 
and there is an, a person who they believe to be an ally in the department who says, I have your back. I'm here for you. Anything you need, I'm going to be there. Even when you are not in the room, know that you're in the room because I'm there. But that inauthentic ally is performative. They actually don't care about the individual. They just look, were, are more concerned about how they look. And so when that person isn't in the room, they don't have their back. It is a pretense of protection. It is a semblance of support, but it is truly inauthentic. It can also be misrepresenting the past. And we think about how people of color are portrayed in the curriculum, how our contributions are portrayed in terms of what we've done for our institutions and our contributions to changing the landscape of education. The past can be misrepresented in ways that makes us feel that those contributions did not exist. And that past injustices were maybe not as bad as people are saying. And the last area that we see race lighting is in resistive actions where individuals um, push back when racism is brought to their attention, where there is a denial of racism that didn't occur, or reverse causality or victim blaming, where we bring something to someone's attention, like someone has done this to me and we bring it to your chair, you bring it to your dean, and their response is to say, well, what is it that you did to cause this to occur? It can also be avoidance of accountability or even what Sean Harper calls public, decora public declarations of incompetence, where we say, I don't know how to handle this. I don't know what to do. And it's interesting because we can publicly declare our incompetence when it comes to addressing issues of race and racism, but no one would ever publicly declare incompetence when it comes to their academic prowess within their own disciplines and fields. The first is we believe that we have to practice radical self-care. And we um, use the term radical because oppression is designed to ensure that we feel this sense of haziness, that we don't feel empowered to do something different. And that we spend so much time focused on the institution and others that we forget about ourselves. And so we believe that it is a form of resistance to practice self-care. That can look a lot of different ways. Sometimes it's just taking a walk. Sometimes it's working out. Uh, me, I've picked up boxing in the past year. Uh, whatever it might be, but we have to have some sort of outlet because ultimately if we don't, the impact of course is the long-term psychological and physiological effects that come along with racial battle fatigue. We also have to learn about these things. We have to have conversations within our own institutions about microaggressions, about race lighting, about racial battle fatigue. We have to lean in on conversations that aren't comfortable, that people don't wanna necessarily talk about. And it has to be part of an ongoing conversation. A one-time conversation on microaggressions is probably a waste of time. Ongoing conversations on microaggressions are more likely to translate into behavioral change. We have to learn about the places and spaces that we're most likely to experience this. So if it's in our department meetings, if it is when I go to the specific uh, office or place on campus, whatever it might be, so that we can learn how we can protect ourselves, first recognizing it and then using that information to protect ourselves. Maybe it means I'm not going to go there as often. Maybe I'm going to avoid that. Or when I do, I'm going to make sure that I'm in that space with allies who can be there to reinforce that it's not me. It's not me at all, it's them. And then transition ourselves to those safer places where we can spend more time in community and with others who can reinforce the value, the dignity and the worth that we bring to the roles that we have. And then lastly, I think that we have to document our own experiences. And that can be for a number of different reasons for me, uh, I've documented my own experiences with race and racism, and I write about it as part of the work that I do. Sometimes I write under my name, J. Luke Wood, and sometimes I write under a pseudonym, depending upon what I'm sharing. But ultimately, I think that it can be cathartic to document what you experience. It also provides a record in case you need to be able to elevate the concerns to a larger area. And so 
ultimately, when, it, when we think about race lighting, there's a lot of things that our campuses can be doing as well. We have to have, again, these places that are safe and healthy. We have to have employee resource groups. At SDSU, we have 16 employee resource groups serving over 800 faculty and staff. They receive resources from the campus in order to support people in networking and coming together in community and just reaffirming one another that I see you, your value, your worth. I think we have to engage in climate assessments, not just focus on campus racial climate, climate tells us what is, but also focusing on harm. It's not about just knowing what is, but how that racism serves to impact us physiologically, psychologically, and in other ways. We have to have ongoing professional learning for faculty and staff on these topics to ensure that there is a structure that will reach people with the right messages at the right times to try to change and ensure that we have an environment that's healthy. And then lastly, we have to make resources available for group and individual counseling because these messages are so pervasive they will make you believing that you're lesser than. They will make you believe that you're not of worth. They will make you believe that you don't belong. And what we need to do is ensure that people know that it is not them, it's race lighting. It is not them, it is racism. And so with that, I'll transition to any uh, questions that folks may have. And I appreciate the time to be able to talk to you about what I believe is an important topic in our time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luke. Uh, it just took me back to so many experiences at SDSU and in CFA. Uh, I'll turn it over to um, Gloria Rhodes to start bringing forward some of the questions and comments we have in Q&A. Gloria? Hi, um, Dr. Wood and everyone on the call. Thank you so much for that informative and um, just a wonderful presentation. Um, there were a couple of questions in the uh, Q&A. One is from Joy and it says, I am speaking out of racial battle fatigue to point out that race lighting takes place within CFA too. Before the day is out, might there be a word of encouragement for those of us who actively promote the union while continuing to live with local microaggression. Dr. Toombs, do you want yeah, to? I, yeah, I, I'll try and answer that one. Um, and this is from Joy Brown, and we have the local microaggression. So uh, I'm going to assume uh, that Joy is talking about uh, battle fatigue and race lighting at her own chapter. And I think some of the advice that Dr. Wood gave us in his closing comments would be appropriate for that chapter uh, to engage in, in terms of having some resources available. Um, and Joy, you need to find a space. I think folks have to be honest uh, and actually admit that these things are in fact happening. I know that's always been a problem uh, in terms of addressing race and racism and all the other uh, uh, offshoots of that is that we don't really wanna talk about it honestly and directly. You must affirm your own experiences, Joy. Uh, you may have been led to believe by cause of the culture uh, that what you were feeling and thinking was not true. Um, so that would be one of the things I would say there. And I also would take it to the statewide level uh, in terms of I know that many of our um, leaders of color are still experiencing this as well, even as we are an anti-racism and social justice union uh, that is trying to address uh, many of these concerns. Gloria, you might want to go into the next question. Okay, the next question is, can you please speak to the effect race lighting has on the intake process with discrimination and harassment cases on our campuses, um, such as signs to look for, et cetera? Yes, and, and I'll say this uh, really more so from my experiences with community colleges. Um, 
uh, and working with faculty in, in that space, um, given that uh, discrimination, harassment, retaliation actually doesn't fall under me. Um, one of the things that I see very commonly is that because people begin to second guess themselves, they allow themselves to be and remain in an environment that is unhealthy and they allow harm to manifest without them actually bringing it to people's attention. They don't bring cases forward. Too often because of the accumulation, we second guess, well, maybe I misunderstood it or maybe they're right. And it's that little bit of doubt that basically allows us to not act and not engage in ways that we need to. And so I think that that's important. The other part of it is then once someone actually gets that to that point, we're like, okay, I'm gonna bring it forward. And they have that, the conversation with whoever an investigator might be, though even the questions that are asked are oftentimes asked in a way that are, are, are trying to get at what, like what happened. And sometimes I find that they, people let things go. They're like, okay, you know what? This isn't worth it. And they'll, and they'll backtrack because they have been conditioned to believe that it must be them. And so I, I think that it's absolutely, um, absolutely clear. I see it all the time in, uh, in, in discrimination, harassment processes. And usually what it means is that we let things go farther than we need to because we don't believe in ourselves enough to push forward. And we've been conditioned for that. And again, that's a function of all those different concepts that we talked about, but it's the impact that that microaggressions, whether it's assaults, insults, or invalidations have on us. Thank you, Dr. Wood. Another question. Um, what an informative session, thank you. What would be a good way for a teacher to handle race lighting in a classroom setting? And there's two parts to this. How do we educate our white students and students of color at the same time? Excellent question. It is an excellent question. Um, I actually think that there's a lot of things that we can do in, in the classroom when these things come up. And I'll give you an example that I see commonly uh, that is, is pretty pervasive. And it deals with uh, talking about a, an area that someone is from. So let's say that you have a student and they're from, um, and you have a, a, a classroom full of different students and someone says the statement, oh yeah, that's, you know, that area of town, that's a bad community. That's a bad area, right? Comes up all the time in, in terms of how people talk about different parts of town. Well, that's a, a microaggression, right? So now microaggression has occurred in the classroom and harm has been done. But what happens with microaggressions is that too often people don't know what to do. They don't know how to respond, how to act. And so what do they do? They freeze and then they don't intervene, intervene. And then later that day or later that next night, they're, they're thinking to themselves, I should have said something, but I didn't. And so my colleague Frank and I have a, a framework that we use for our training and development called the Raven approach that we develop. And it's basically, how do you respond to microaggressions when they occur? And the first thing that we think you do is that you redirect, you intervene, you correct, you pull aside. So, you know, I, I wanna stop you right there after someone has said that. Um, I wanna follow up on what you said. Can I speak to you for, for a moment? Let me interject because what you're trying to do is to stop it. Because again, harm has been done. And you, if you don't stop it, then you're allowing harm to manifest in that environment. The second thing I think you do is you start to ask probing questions to clarify what was said, to understand someone's intent and get a greater explanation. What you're really doing is trying to ask a question in a way that allows them to understand what they've done without you having to intercede. I, you know, you can say, I, you know, I think I heard you say that was a bad community. What did you mean by that? Or I want to make sure I understand what you're saying. Were you saying that X? Or can you explain that further to me? What do you mean? That's important because what you're trying to do is use questions. And about, you know, I'm going to make up a number 25% of the time. Let's say the person recognizes, hey, I shouldn't have said that. And it's an opportunity for them to self-correct. We also believe that you reaffirm the values that you have. Um, it can be every organization has values. We have mission statements for our campuses, for our departments. And even within our own classrooms, within our syllabi, we oftentimes have ground rules that are designed to create an environment that is safe and welcoming for all students. So you remind them of that. You can say, you know, I just want to remind us that our classroom ground rules state that we do X. Or, you know, in this department, we work hard to create a space that is safe and welcoming. Or, and I've said this before at my own campus directly to someone, 
what you said is not in alignment with our institutional values around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Then what I think you can do is you can emphasize your own thoughts and feelings using eye language and personal experience. When I hear your comments, I think this, or for me personally, that statement was X in my experience and doing that so that they can understand what they've done. And then the last part of what I would argue and that we should say is talking about next steps. And if we think about the four different types of race lighting messages, right? Resistant actions, inauthentic allyships, advancing stereotypes, like we have to basically then know that that's the message. We have to counter that message with a different message that demonstrates what does it mean to be a true ally, not an inauthentic one, that represents history in an authentic and, and true way, that honors and believes in people and that counters stereotypes. So things that you could say is to that person, it's important for us to be good allies. Or if someone is putting down a, a student of color and their intelligence, we need to recognize his brilliance and give him space to succeed. Or we need to authentically demonstrate that we value her ideas. Or a person who's been part of combining uh, and contributing to a microaggressive situation can say to another person, I'm going to apologize. You should do the same so that there's an action step that goes along with it. And let me say this, in terms of this framework, it's not about the R, the A, the V, the E, the N. It's really about recognizing that we have to do something and that too often we freeze. Sometimes it's the R and the A, sometimes it's the E and the N, sometimes it's the whole process. But the main point that we have to recognize is that when it occurs in our classroom, we have a responsibility to do something because if we don't, if we don't, if we don't say anything, then we do so from a standpoint of privilege that our students don't have. Question, can you point to any self-assessment resources uh, could, that could be used to help folks see when they are racially gaslighting others? When they are racially gaslighting others. Um, I don't have any self-assessment resources at this time that I can offer, but what I would say is this, is that my experience is in general, if you feel like you're being race light, lighted or race lit, you probably are. And the reason for that is that how racism is designed is to make us second guess ourselves. So if you get to the point where you're like, mm -hmm. huh, maybe there is something there, it probably means you've crossed that point. Okay. And um, I wonder if Dr. Wood could speak to the intersections of race and class, where in Black or POC, people of color tenured or administrative faculty may utilize their own internalized oppression to mentor less powerful workers to accept white supremacy rather than speaking out against it. Well, I mean, I, I certainly do see that. Um, we do have individuals who have internalized racism. Um, if I think about, um, you know, from a personal perspective, even my, my own experience growing up, um, I was in an environment that was overtly racist. I responded by becoming the person who I am, which is I am a critical race scholar. I focus on training and development around these topics. And my career is, is, is dedicated to advancing racial equity in education. But I can also look at how other family members that I've had who are in that same environment, who are the same race as I am, responded differently and internalized that racism. So one thing I, I, I think is important to recognize is that when we see someone who's internalized it, is to recognize that they have, there's a lot that they of, of, of hate that they have probably accumulated over time. So that doesn't excuse their actions, it helps to explain it. And then in terms of what we do, I think that we have to hold them accountable and we have to say something. You know, if you think about uh, Dr. Stella Ben-Simone, she's a uh, ret recently retired professor from the Center for Urban Education at USC. Her work is focused on, on racial equity. And she talks about this concept of being equity-minded. And two big pieces about being equity-minded is first, we have to recognize um, our own contributions to these issues. We have to reflect and say, what am I doing or not doing that's contributing to this? And we don't get to just externalize the institution, say that that's not part of it because we're within the institution. If we're part of an institution that's racist, 
that we have a responsibility to do something. And part of that that brings us to the second point is that we have to challenge one another. We have to hold one another accountable. We have to say things that aren't comfortable. We have to lean in on those conversations because we want to create a better organization. And I think that, that we do have to speak out even when they are people within our own community. We do so in a way that is loving. We do so in a way that is caring. We do so in a way that is inviting. But again, if we don't say something, then we do so from a standpoint of privilege that our students don't have. Thank you. And this is such a compliment to your work. Uh, this next question, comment. Dr. Wood, I can see how your research can and should be taught in law schools, just as uh, CRT, critical race theory, is taught in law schools. Is race lighting been included in the law in any way, included in, including court cases? An administrator has accused a person of color of microaggressions against a white student. Isn't this a misuse of the term? Um, so let me take the first part of that question. In terms of it being used, um, you'll see um, there is a concept on racial gaslighting that's been used in the in court arenas. It's uh, a concept that focuses specifically on case law and how case law can serve to gaslight communities. And one of the good examples I've seen of that is how uh, during Japanese internment, I believe it's uh, the case is Korematsu versus the US, where what they did was they basically were interning the Japanese and then the response was, well, no, it has nothing to do with their race. It has to do with X. And so there is some work that's been done on that that's really good work that I can point folks to, uh, but it is not really, I haven't seen it transition into, into, court, into court cases, but it is in analysis of case law that I have seen that. And then the second part of that is administrator has accused a person of color of microaggressions against a white student. Isn't that a misuse of the term? Uh, I would believe, well, if we were talking about racial microaggressions, given the definition of racial microaggressions, yes, I would believe that that is a misuse of the term. Uh, I could say that it could be inappropriate, depending upon the context. It could be, um, it could be, you know, wildly inappropriate, but I wouldn't call that a microaggression or a racial microaggression um, in that in that particular case. Uh, so administrators accuse a person of color of microaggressions against a white student. Yeah, I don't think so. Um, I see a question here that I'd like to jump to. Um, would you read the one that's to uh, the next one down after that? There is that one starting with there. Okay, yeah. there is a difference. With, thank you. Um, there is a difference between the stated values of a university and the actual culture of that university. Agree or disagree? Can you speak to that? Agree. And here's, I will be real specific in, in my example here. One of the examples of uh, race lighting that I offered was a semblance of support and, and that is, or inauthentic allyship. I want you all to think about this for a moment. After the murder of George Floyd, how many campuses released statements saying, we stand with the black community. We reject racism and anti-blackness. We strive to create a culture that is warm and affirming for all individuals within our community. And then if you looked at the action that came along with it, then you would have recognized that the statement in and of itself was the campus's perception of action and that there was nothing actually coming after it that was going to create a better life and condition for those individuals. And let's say that a campus was really dangerous, right? They went even further and they did a hearing session or a listening circle and they thought that that accomplished it. And ultimately it's not about releasing statements because a statement without action is an inauthentic message. It gaslights, it race lights the people who are within that community, especially when there's no desire to do something different. So I completely agree with that sentiment. And Gloria, can I ask one of the questions here? Um, Absolutely. Yeah, what if you're uh, actively organizing for your chapter or uh, organizing just on your campus to create a less uh, racist environment and structure, but you're experiencing microaggressions while you're trying to do that important work, uh, what are your suggestions for how we continue to do that? 
Well, let me say this. Uh, unfortunately, I don't believe that you can organize against racism without being in facing the brunt of racism. So I would say that that is probably the most common experience for many of us who having who having dedicated our careers to trying to transform our institutions and organizations. So I would go back to some of the original uh, kind of comments about uh, radical self care. You know, maybe and let me give maybe some specific examples. Maybe it's that you're going to be more restricted with your time. Maybe I'm not gonna, I'm gonna try not to have meetings before 10 o'clock, right? So I can be, be really be, be protective of myself. Maybe I'm not gonna to respond to email on, on Sundays and I'm used to responding to emails 24 hours a day. Maybe I'm not gonna sleep with my phone next to my head so that every time in the middle of the night that goes off, I'm up and responding the messages. Maybe I'm going to focus on, uh, on my engagement within the community with people who are outside of my organization, who will see my value, who will see my worth, who will, who will tell me that, that, that the work that I'm doing is valuable, that the contributions I'm making are worthwhile, that my presence is important. So I think that it's really about having those counter spaces of safety, recognizing that most of our institutions were never designed for people who look like us, and as a result, we have to be committed to having counter spaces to protect ourselves while we work to create better institutions. Thank you, uh, Dr. Wood. I wanna be uh, aware of time. So um, I, there is a couple of questions. Uh, this one is, and, and people are thanking you so much for your sessions, but it's, Speaking of calling in, how do we help our colleagues who tend to not reflect on their own microaggressive words and actions that has pervasive impact on work culture? Okay, so we have a framework that we developed after doing um, a lot of work on microaggressions. And I would go out to a college and I was gonna be doing like a presentation on let's say uh, racial microaggressions. And it was a brown bag invite for anybody who wanted to come, 30, 40 people show up in a room. And I'm excited. I'm glad to be there. I walk into the room and I see the person who's putting on the event and I can see this look of dismay on their face. And they would usually say to me, you know, when we invited you here, it was because of Jerry from chemistry and Susan from financial aid, because we all know that they are microaggressing the heck out of our students. But Jerry and Susan aren't going to come to a voluntary session. Why? Because they don't care. And so with that, I, we learn that there are really different populations. There's, and it comes down to two different characteristics. First, having the knowledge of what to do when it comes to issues of racial equity. And second, having the willingness to do it. So it's knowledge and action, knowledge and action. And they don't always go hand in hand. For example, many of us know how to eat well and healthy, but we don't always do so. Many of us know how to work out, but we don't always do so, right? And so we start to put that together and we have a framework that we've developed. Um, one group is called the choir, the people who are dedicated to the work of equity and they're doing the work. Another group are the allies who are willing to do the work. They just don't know necessarily what that looks like. So we have to provide them with further training and development. Then we have those who don't know the, how to do the work and aren't, aren't willing. We call them resistors and there's two different types active resistors and passive resistors. Active resistors will actively resist. I've been to campuses where individuals have sent out emails throughout the whole campus telling them don't let us speak because it's an example of reverse racism and reverse discrimination. But most people who are resistors aren't active, they're passive. They just wanna stay out of the fray. They hear that we're coming, they hear there's a conversation, they're gonna vote with their lack of presence. They're simply not gonna come. Then there's the final group within that framework, which are those who know what to do, but are unwilling to do it. And those are individuals who've usually been uh, forced to go to mandatory training for something that they've done. So they have the knowledge, but they don't have the, the willingness to put it into action. We were presenting this framework at a conference several years ago. And one of the funders we were working with was like, you know, there's something missing here. Uh, what about the people who fall in the middle? The people who think they know what to do and really don't the people who think they're willing and, will, and really aren't. And what we do is we call them the oblivious, the oblivious. And they're really characterized by three different characteristics. First, they have a savior complex. They think their job is to save 
not to empower. They think they know the answers. They don't and aren't open to conversation and listening. They bring a deficit mindset to equity work. The second group are those who are non-reflective. They know how to use the right language, the non-reflective people. They know to say Latinx as opposed to Latino because it's more gender inclusive, right? They know to say equity as opposed to equality because it's a different connotation. But if you look at what they say and then what they actually do, those two things are totally removed from one another. And then the last group I would say are those who are grandstanders, those who do the work of racial equity for the public image. Because if you go back 20, 30 years ago, many of you know, it wasn't cool to be the equity person. It wasn't viewed as being something that was greater a badge of honor. But as many people have pushed so hard to create these conversations, now you can create a, a, a career on equity. And so what it's done is it's invited people within to our, our ranks who may not have the right commitments, who may have been on an equity journey, but then thought it was an end destination, not a lifelong journey, who didn't continue in their own growth and development. And so it's about them. It's about themselves. It's about their career. It's about their public image. And one of the things that we say is the most important to reach those individuals, the oblivious category, which is I think what you're talking about in this question, is that we have to engage them in personal conversations that convey humility and demonstrate that we all have work to do. If anyone was to ever say when it comes to Black students, Latinx students, LGBTIQ plus students, students with disabilities, that I'm a choir for every single group there is on the campus, if you say that, you're probably part of the problem because all of us have work to do. And it's about those personal conversations that convey humility, that demonstrate where we need to go. Thank you. We are about at time and I wanna make sure we have a, a little opportunity to take a, a short break and for, before our next session with Dr. Canton. But I, I do wanna get to this question. Um, any recommendations for dealing with our campus removal of mask mandate, seeing this as direct harm to biopic communities and an emergent example of race lighting? I think it depends upon how the me those messages and conversations are conveyed. Um, if the conversation is one that makes you feel that you are being race lit, lit then you probably are, right? And so I think it really depends upon how it's being how it's being rolled out and what that looks like. And and the truth is, uh, I heard this, this this quote yesterday that was really good. It says, "Only you know when you've had enough." only you know when you've been race lit. And so if you think that that's what you've experienced, then you probably have. Um, and that's been my experience. I know that I experience it in my own work and a daily experience. I know I face racial battle fatigue and a daily experience. And so my guess is if, if you're in the, you're in the trench, trenches and you're doing the work too, that you're probably experiencing it as well. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Wood. And CFA, let's give Dr. Wood some CFA love. And I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Toon. Yeah, I just want to say there was so much in this presentation. I know many uh, in the audience want more. Uh, and all you need to do is read some of Dr. Woods' publications uh, that really explain this in more detail. Uh, and as we end though, I, I just uh, wanna, uh, bring up uh, a phrase that Dr. Wood said. It's what is really said uh, that we need to sometimes pay attention to as we begin to learn more about uh, race lighting. Complicated, I know in CFA land, we have been talking about our racial battle fatigue uh, since the pandemic, since um, uh, the racial reckoning that occurred in 2020 with the deaths of so many uh, Black folks. So with that, uh, we thank you again, Dr. Wood, for this amazing presentation. Uh, I know I look forward to you continuing to do your great work at SDSU, and I'm glad to be uh, part of that myself. 